You know, today a large percentage of the bass that are caught are caught on crankbaits, and there's a good reason for that. When fishing crankbaits, you can cover a lot of water, and crankbaits appeal to three of the different senses that a bass uses to find their food. The sense of sight, sound, and vibration. You know, all crankbaits look a lot alike, but they're really different because each of the crankbaits will run at different depths. They have different little wobbles and wiggles, and there's various times when you should be using uh, uh, the different types of crankbaits. And during this program, I'm going to talk to you and explain to you how I have been able to catch bass on crankbaits during all seasons of the year. I'm going to be talking about the different rods and reels that you'd use to fish crankbaits, the different line sizes that affect the depth that a crankbait will run, and things like that that are very important to becoming a good crankbait fisherman. We're going to start off by talking about the pre-spawn period, which normally occurs in February and March in different sections of the United States, depending on where you're geographically located. You know, the, the bass in just about any lake spend most of the winter out in the real deep water, and uh, they winter there and stay dormant. And then in early spring, as I mentioned earlier, in February or March, the bass start their migration into coves and pockets and places like we have here where they'll actually do their spawning. The pre-spawn is a, really a, a, a fun time to fish because a variety of crankbaits will work this time of the year. One of the most successful lures, the lures that I've had the greatest success with, is a rattle trap. Now, you know, it, this particular little pocket here has some little side coves and irregular features and a lot of cover in it. This is the type of places that the bass will move up into first during the pre-spawn period. This particular cove faces the north. The back of this cove is facing the north and that keeps a, the cold north winds from blowing into this cove. That's, that's why the cove will warm up a lot quicker. Uh, for instance, this cove and, and the dead back of this cove, the water temperature could be as high as 58 degrees during pre-spawn period. And out on the main lake, just 300 yards away, the water temperature out there may be 50 degrees, so it can differ a lot. Not to say that there's not a lot of bass out on the main lake, but we're only interested in those bass we can catch, and these bass in the warmer water are going to be more, much more active. Now, I use the uh, DT1 Micronar surface temperature gauge to tell me the exact temperature of the water. This is really critical during the pre-spawn because, again, you're looking for the warmest water you can find where the bass are more active. I use my compass a lot during the pre-spawn period, especially when I'm fishing a strange lake and I'm not sure which direction is north. The compass will tell me which direction is north and I can find those coves where the back end is facing the north. And as I mentioned earlier, these particular coves will warm up quicker. This particular cove or the type of cove that you want to look for during the pre-spawn period is a cove that has a defined creek channel like this one here that comes all the way to the back of the cove. We've got 20 and 25 feet of water out here in the main channel. This particular cove has some nice little side pockets like we have over here with some points coming out, 15 foot of water running back into these side pockets. There's a lot of cover in this particular cove. This is the type of cove that bass are going to move up in and spawn first. You know, line size is really critical when you're fishing crankbaits, and the way I select line size is according to the amount of cover I'm fishing and the type of crankbait I'm using. For instance, on rattle traps, I like to use somewhere between 10 and 14 pound tests. A lot of times, if I'm not fishing real thick cover, I'll use 10 pound tests because really the lighter line you use when you're crankbait fishing, the more action you get out of your lure and the more strikes you're gonna get. Uh, there are three basic retrieves that I use when I'm fishing a rattle trap that have been real productive for me. Let's talk about the first retrieve because you know actually the speed of, that the lure is coming through the water, that's what actually causes the bass to hit it. The basic retrieve to me with a rattle trap, the one I do the very best with is just a medium retrieve. Just make a semi-long cast and uh, reel the lure at a medium rate of speed. Now most of the time the bass will react to this retrieve especially when the water temperature is cold. You know, during the pre-spawn, as I was mentioning earlier, the water temperature is gonna be in the mid 50s and high 50s, and these bass are not real active. As I said earlier, we're fishing, uh, this particular cove has some scattered clumps of hydrilla. The bass are hiding uh, and relating to the hydrilla, so I'm just cranking around these clumps of hydrilla and catching the bass right out of these shallow clumps. Another retrieve that I use as the water warms up, I'll use a fast retrieve where you're actually burning the rattle trap. This makes the rattles really rattle and 
This retrieve can be especially productive once the water starts to warm up some, get up above uh, all around 60 degrees or so. Another retrieve I use that's real productive is the real slow pumping retrieve. When the water's cold like it is now and the bass are sluggish, this slow pumping retrieve works real well. Stow the lure out, you take your rod and pump it and fish it real slow, just a real slow retrieve, letting it go towards the bottom and sink, then picking back up on it and then letting those rattlers rattle and work. And Oh, look a here. Boy, what a strike. Mm. Boy, that one is fighting. So watch that rod bend. If you'll notice, I'm letting the rod bend and really flex and trying to keep that fish on there. Don't let a fish jump ever with a, on a slack line. Keep a tight line when they're jumping. That way you're not going to lose near as many fish. There we go. Bring him right on up and in. I got this one on both hooks. That's good. That's what you're looking for, a good hookup. That's a nice little bass. This little male. There you go. That bass came off of a little underwater point. We're fishing in the back of this cove with a lot of scattered hydrilla along the uh, edges of the, the brake line here. I'm sitting out in about 10 foot of water and there's a little shallow underwater point over here where I just cast to and caught that bass. It runs out there with about three or four foot of water on top of it and it drops off in this eight and 10 foot of water. A little scattered hydrilla around there. I was using a slow pumping retrieve that time as I was talking about earlier. Sometimes that slow pumping retrieve will get you a strike when nothing else will, especially when the water's still real cold. After you catch a bass or two, anytime you're fishing, you know, you sort of get the, uh, the feel of what's going on and how the bass want the lure. Your presentation is really always the key to catching bass. You just have to present the lure in the way that the bass want to hit it. Uh, sometimes it'll be the medium retrieve, sometimes it'll be the pumping motion, but let the bass tell you what he wants. If you'll listen to the bass, they'll be talking to you a lot of times. You've probably heard that saying before, and it's true. A lot of fishermen, they just continue to fish one type of retrieve, whether it's working or not. I've always changed up until I start catching bass. Try a slow retrieve, try the moderate retrieve, uh, then step up and try a fast retrieve. Bass are really unpredictable. You can't tell what they're going to do until you start catching them. After you've caught a couple of bass, then you, you're starting to establish a pattern and get some idea how the bass want the lure work. Today it seems like they're wanting the lure on a real slow pumping retrieve. Again, these fish are situated uh, back in the back of a cove, which is facing the north. The water temperature back here is in the high 50s. And these bass are moving up, getting ready to spawn. They're on the pre-spawn pattern. And uh, the type of cover there, holding on is scattered hydrilla with a few little buck bushes out in the water here and these bass aren't on the beds yet they're just moving back in here getting ready to spawn ah come here boy ah, I got a little grass on this one you now when you're fighting a bass with a rattle trap you'd only want to put enough pressure on them to keep them coming your direction when they're wanting to come uh, these treble hooks pull out real easily, so keep the fish coming. When he wants to play, when he wants to move and go the other direction, let him go. You've got to fight him because these treble hooks, you'll lose a lot of fish if you're not careful with the rattle trap. There you go. Come here, boy. Ali hooked this one right, in the, right underneath the chin. Hell, he was hooked pretty good. One thing I always carry is a good pair of needle nose pliers and a lot of times you have to use them. I don't want to hurt this fish. We're going to try to release him, let her go back. Uh, hopefully she'll spawn out and produce a whole bunch of little bass. There we go. Let me show you some of the lures that have always been real productive for me during the pre-spawn. I guess uh, if I had to pick one lure that I probably caught more bass on during the pre-spawn, it'd be the rattle trap. And they're two different sizes that I use, the half ounce version and the three quarter ounce version. Both of these rattle traps will work from time to time, depending on how deep the bass are holding. The bigger rattle trap, of course, will get down four, five, six foot deep, even on a fast retrieve because it's heavier. These are vibrating type lures. They do not have bills, so they only go as deep as, it depends on how fast you pull the lures as to how deep they will actually go. But again, the heavier one, the three quarter ounce, will go a little deeper because it's heavier. Both of these lures are extremely noisy. They have rattlers in them. Uh, they do an awful good job of attracting bass, uh, especially during the pre-spawn. 
These, these lures will work well in clear water. They work real good in murky water and also muddy water. Uh, another lure that looks a whole lot like a rattle trap is a hot spot that I've had a lot of success with. This is a Arkansas shad colored hot spot I'm holding here. And the difference between these two lures is the hot spot is a little bit lighter and it only has one rattler in it. It doesn't make quite as much noise. You know, there are times when bass want a lot of noise, they want noisy lures, and there's other times when they don't want a lot of noise. Normally, when the water is real clear and still, the bass don't want a lot of noise. So the, uh, the hot spot is much more productive during that period of time. Uh, when the water is, is uh, uh, you have wind conditions and, and, and rough water, or murky water, or muddy water even, the rattle trap is more productive because it does make a noise and, and a lot of rattling, and this creates the strikes for you again. Another lure that has worked extremely well for me during pre-spawn is the shad wrap in a crawfish pattern. Caught hundreds of bass all over the United States with this little lure. It has a real tight wobble or uh, not a whole lot of vibration. And I feel like in real cold water, you'd, uh, bass definitely don't want a lot of vibration because most of the little creatures that live out in the lake this time of the year when the water is cold, they're real sluggish. They're not real active, so they're not making a lot of vibration and swimming around real fast and actively like they do later on in the year when the water warms up. But the shad wrap will run down about six or seven feet deep if you use eight and 10 pound test line and you do have to use awful light line to fish this little lure because it's real light in weight. It's hard to cast. Very productive little lure though. Another lure that I catch a lot of bass on is the Bomber 7A. This particular one is chartreuse colored which is a good clear water, murky water, or even muddy water selection. The 7A will run down about seven to eight feet depending on what size line you're using. For instance, with eight and 10 pound test, it will get down to about eight feet. Uh, a lot of times I'll fish the 7A on 14 pound test line, which doesn't allow it to run quite as deep. And as I said earlier, during the pre-spawn, the bass are actually suspended a lot of the time. They're not relating to the bottom. They're moving up uh, maybe in 10 to 15 foot of water in these little side pockets like we have here, but they're actually suspended out over this deeper water and the bass may only be down five to seven feet. So what you're trying to do is select lures that will get down to the depth the fish are holding at. Just keep in mind, try these different lures and let the fish tell you which ones they like best. Don't make up your mind what you're gonna fish with before you go out on the lake. Uh, try all these lures and, and once you start catching bass, after you catch two or three on a particular lure, stay with it. But let the bass tell you which lures they like best on each given day because each day will be different uh, cloudy days, for instance, a lot of times the bass in the spring will be a little bit deeper, believe it or not, because the sun is not warming this water up and the fish tend to be a little bit deeper down. Uh, on real bright sunny days with a little bit of wind, they'll come up within four or five feet of the surface and that's when the rattle trap really catches a lot of bass. As you can see here, we have a variety of colors of crankbaits laid out here and uh, the way I choose colors, uh, I try to match the color to the type of bait fish I feel like the bass are feeding on. For instance, uh, the crawfish pattern, if bass are feeding on crawfish, I like the crawfish pattern in crankbait. That works extremely well. Your Tennessee shad colored crankbaits are awful productive, like this one here that the large rattle trap is in. Uh, this, of course, resembles a bait fish, a shad, or some type of bait fish that the bass may be feeding on. Uh, I try to match the colors to the water conditions, the actual clarity of the water. For instance, if I'm fishing murky to muddy water, I want something that I can see fairly well in the, in the water. Uh, one of my favorites in murky to muddy water is chartreuse. This color here, like the Bomber 7A with the orange belly, uh, bass can see this lure real well in murky to muddy water, and I feel like I can uh, catch more bass on, on, a, on a lure that's uh, more visible in the, in the murky to muddy water situations. But again, uh, colors are not that important to me. I feel like uh, your, your chromes, your, your shad colors, your, your, your patterns, your color patterns that imitate some type of bait fish that the bass are feeding on. Again, crawfish colored is awful good. Your chromes are hard to beat in clear water, but try to match your colors to the uh, water clarity conditions. Uh, one problem a lot of fishermen have with crankbait fishing always is losing fish on crankbaits. Now most of the hooks that come on these crankbaits that the manufacturers put on them are not the best hook that you could be using. These hooks, there's nothing really wrong with them, but they're just not as sharp as they could be or they're not as strong as they could be. So a couple of years ago, I was introduced to a hook that's made over in England. It's by the Partridge Company, and it's distributed here in the United States by the Weller Company up, up in Duluth, Minnesota. This particular hook is a much stronger hook, and it's a much sharper hook. Uh, when you're replacing these hooks on crankbaits, keep in mind though, you must put the same size hook back on the crankbait that the manufacturer has put on there. 
because if you don't, you're going to change the action of the lure and it's not going to work properly. But again, these little hooks are much, much stronger. As you can see here, they're a little bit larger in diameter. They have extremely sharp points. You even have to be careful when you're handling these or they'll, they'll stick you in the finger. Uh, one thing I do as, as I use a crankbait and the hooks become uh, somewhat dull after I catch a number of bass on them, I always take a little file with me. I keep this in my boat all the time and whether I'm crankbait fishing or jig fishing or worm fishing or whatever, I keep the hooks extremely sharp. After I catch a few bass on a lure and the hooks tend to get a little bit dull, I take my little file and I very carefully with an upward stroke uh, file each each treble hook that's on this lure and try to get a real good point on it. The better the point is and the sharper it is, the better penetration that you can get. Once you hook the fish and get him, uh, get him on the lure, the longer he fights and the more he struggles, the better you're going to hook him. You now when fishing crankbaits, I always use a little Berkley uh, crosslock snap. Uh, what the little snap does, it enables me to change crankbaits quickly. You know, when I go out on a new lake, I'm not any uh, more certain what lures the fish are going to hit than you are or what colors they're going to react to. So the little cross-like snap just enables me to change lures quickly and also change colors of lures until I find out what the bass want to hit on that particular day. Uh, the little snap also gives your plug more action. It lets it work freely and it just gives it a lot more action in the water. Let me show you how to tie a real good knot and uh, feel like this is really important because you know a lot of times when you break your line or your line breaks on you it's not the line itself that's breaking it's coming loose or breaking in the knot so it's real important to know how to tie a real good knot the knot that I use most of the time is a trialing knot and it's a real simple knot to tie and it's a 100 percent knot and what I mean by that is the line will most always break before the knot will so it is a 100 percent knot and it's real easy to tie. Let me go through the steps of tying this knot and just show you exactly how to tie it. First of all, you thread the line through the little snap eyelet here and come around, always working with enough line to enable you to tie the knot easily. Go back through the little eyelet one more time, so that's two times you're passing through the little eyelet. And you pull it up and you'll be forming a loop like I have here. Okay, when you get to this point and with the loop, you take the line and wrap it to the outside just like you were tying a clinch knot and make about three wraps with it like I'm doing here and come back through the center of both of these loops. When you get to this point here, a uh, mistake a lot of fishermen make is pulling the knot up too fast. This burns the line and frays it and causes it to be weak. So what I normally do is just wet the line with my lips and pull it up real slowly like this and evenly you want to pull the knot up extremely tight and get it where it will not slip when you set the hook or while you're fighting a fish. So knowing a good knot and knowing how to tie it properly are really important because remember, your knot and, your, and the line are the main link between you and the fish. Come here, boy. There's a good fish. Now that bass was right on the side of that point, right where he's supposed to be. That's a pretty good fish. Boy, I mean, he's frisky. I'll tell you one thing. When you're unhooking a bass with a crankbait, let me tell you one thing that's really important. Get a good hold on that fish. You don't want to hurt him, but get a good firm grasp on him, and you don't want him shaking and jumping around and getting those hooks in you. So make sure you've got a good hold on him when you start getting that plug loose, because if he flounces and jumps out of your hand, he's going to drive one of those hooks right into you. It's really important. There you go. Let this one go back to spawn. Let me talk a little bit about equipment, the type of rod and reel that I use for crankbait fishing. I feel like the rod is really an important piece of equipment when you're fishing crankbaits because you need a rod that has a, uh, a lot of tip action, as this rod has. You see here, I've got a lot of tip ac action to absorb that strike and also to play the fish. You don't want a real stiff rod when you're crankbaiting. You want a rod that flexes and allows the fish to fight. Because again, with treble hooks, if you're not careful, you're going to pull these hooks right out of the fish's mouth. You have to play the fish very carefully. I personally use a six foot medium action Bass Pro Shop boron rod. That's my favorite crankbait rod, especially for fishing the rattle trap and uh, the shad wrap and small light crankbaits. For the heavier crankbaits, I go for the seven foot uh, uh, medium action two handed rod. Uh, I use that for fishing heavier lures like the three quarter ounce rattle trap. This big two-handed rod allows me to handle the larger baits a little bit better and, and uh, make longer casts and 
The seven foot medium action rod, again, that has a lot of uh, flex in the tip, which enables you to uh, play the fish adequately. Uh, you, again, you don't want a rod that's real stiff. You want a lot of tip action where you can fight the fish with a crankbait. Uh, on the two-handed rod, I use the 1310 Quantum Reel. It's a real good reel for, for fishing these heavier crankbaits. When I'm using the uh, smaller rattle trap and the shad wraps and real light crankbaits, I use a little 1510, the Zebco Quantum 1510. Now this is a little thumb bar reel and it's a real lightweight reel that allows you to cast real light line like eight and 10 pound test line where you can fish these smaller lighter lures and make real good long cast, accurate cast with these lures. You know, accurate casting is really important in bass fishing. Uh, one of the mistakes I see so many anglers make, especially when I'm guiding people a lot of the time, they're not able to handle their equipment. They can't make real accurate casts. If you can't cast accurately and cast right to the types of places that these bass are situated back in these coves and pockets, then you're not going to be able to catch them. Line size is critical when fishing crankbaits. For instance, uh, as an example, you wouldn't want to try to fish a little quarter ounce uh, Rapala shad wrap on heavy line. You have to use either eight or 10 pound test line, real light line, because again, this little lure is real light. It weighs a quarter of an ounce and it catches a lot of wind. In fact, when you're fishing this little crankbait, even on eight and 10 pound line, you have to fish with the wind. You cannot cast this little light lure into the wind. So again, choose light line when you're fishing your real light crankbaits. Or right, when you're fishing a little bit larger crankbait, like uh, this uh, little Bomber 7A here, uh, you can go to a little bit heavier line, like 10 pound test or even 12 pound test. So you match your line accordingly with the weight and size of the crankbait and also how much, uh, how wind resistant that bait particular lure is. When you get up into a 3 8 ounce crankbait, you can even go to 12 and 14 pound test line. So uh, the heavier the bait, the larger line you can uh, use. This doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna wanna use the larger line, but you can fish heavier lines on your bigger crankbaits. You can cast them and they will uh, react properly. Uh, the real small lures, you have to use the light line because you take away from the action if you don't. As the lures get larger, you can go to heavier line. For an example, a lot of times when I'm fishing the Bagley DB2 crankbait, uh, I'll use 14 pound test line, which is fairly heavy line for crankbait fishing, but if I'm fishing real thick cover, heavy timber, or logs and stumps, or perhaps I'm fishing over real thick vegetation out in 8 to 10 foot of water where bass has an opportunity uh, to get me in a lot of cover and entangle me, then I'll go to heavier line like 14 pound test because this size crankbait, you can fish it on heavier line and it doesn't take away from the action. Another example, when I'm using the Man's Deep 20, uh, I can even go up to 17 and 20 pound test line because a lot of times this big lure, I'll be in contact with some awful big bass. And if I'm fishing real heavy cover, I'll go to real heavy line because I don't want to lose any of these fish. Another thing that heavy line will do for you is once you hang the big lure up, if you're fishing thick cover, I can take my seven foot rod on heavy line, 17 and 20 pound test, and I can pull and, and actually bend the hooks out and I won't lose as many lures if I'm using heavier line. Sometimes using real light line and fishing thick cover, not only do you uh, lose big fish, but you hang up and lose a lot of lures. So again, I'll go to 17 and 20 pound test at times when I'm fishing the big crankbaits like the Man's Deep 20 or the Rebel Maxi R. There's several different crankbaits that are my favorites when it comes to fishing thick cover. Now, this particular little cove I'm fixing to fish is has got a lot of flooded timber in it. It's got real, some old lay down logs, some real thick uh, uh, brush and cover. And you know, a lot of your crankbaits, you just spend a whole lot of time hung up with them. And, and of course, you're casting into areas that you're suspecting to catch a bass. And you, if you hang the cover and pull on the cover, you spook the fish and you don't ever have the opportunity to catch him. So a couple of lures that I rely on real heavily to fish thick cover with the old backup style bomber, uh, one I have here is a Tennessee shad colored bomber that works extremely well for me, and a mud bug. These two uh, crankbaits will come through cover real well compared to the other crankbaits. Let's see if we can catch one, and I, I think I can show you a little bit about what I'm talking about. We have a lot of timber in this cove, a lot of old laydowns and logs and places that are just terrible to throw a crankbait. But this particular lure will come through most of it if you just kind of feel it across the uh, logs. And once you feel something, don't start tugging on it real hard. Just let it work itself across the cover. Naturally, bass are going to be around some type of cover all the time. And in this particular cove, they're going to end up spawning right up here on the shoreline in and around these old logs. But, but again, this lure comes through cover real well. And if you'll just kind of pick your cast and let it just crawl across logs or whether you're fishing bushes, Oh, there's one. 
Oh, that's a good one. Got to work him around this log here. There you go. There you go. That little bass hit right on the end of that log. Huh? Boy, that's fun. A little bass hit this backup bomber. I was fishing these old logs in here. A lot of lay down logs and real thick cover that you, it's hard to fish a normal crankbait in, in this thick of cover. Let him go here. It's got a lot of thick cover in here. And the reason this lure is a little bit more weedless, it's the angle that it runs at through the water and also the bill. This bill just, uh, it runs hard at this angle and the bill comes in contact with the, with the cover first. And if you'll just work it real easily over the cover, it'll just kind of glide and slide over things and it really doesn't hang that bad because I'm fishing a real log jam back here. I'm trying to work the crankbait right past these stumps, just throwing right up to them and coming right by them on, with a medium retrieve. Again, there's a lot of heavy cover in here and this particular model of bomber, the old backup bomber comes through the cover real well. Old stump there ought to produce a bass. I'm gonna cast it right up to it and you can just work this bomb, bring it right over the top of that stump. Ah, there's one. Boy, he's in the thick, I'm gonna have to work him right around that log. <clears throat> there he is. Boy, this is a little bit better one. There you go. Now when I'm fishing this crankbait back in this thick cover like this, I'm normally using about 14 pound test line. There's no reason to use real light line back in this thick cover. The water depth here is about five feet and just real thick cover. A lot of old logs and, and stumps and lay down trees. The type of places you're gonna find a big bass. Now a lot of bass will be uh, spawning in this cove in a, just a matter of days now. The water temperature is warming up. It's in the high 50s now, and once the temperature gets up to around 60 and stabilizes, these bass will move right up in these old logs and spawn. They're out here kind of along this little channel that leads into this cove right now, and uh, that's where I'm getting these hits on the bomber crankbait, just cranking this uh, crankbait along these old logs and stuff, following this, this little channel that comes into this cove. Actually, these fish are hitting in about five foot of water, around heavy cover, real close to the 10, 12 foot channel out here. Another real productive area during the pre-spawn or, or spawn either on uh, a lot of your big reservoirs are the main lake flats or ridges out actually on the main lake. We're out in the middle of the lake nearly now. It's a big flat out here that runs out nearly to the old Sabine River channel out here behind me the, uh, where the timber starts, the water drops off into 30, 40, and even 50 foot deep in the old channel. But we're fishing a big flat here, open water, very little, uh, not many stumps or logs or anything in here, no standing timber, it's just a lot of scattered hydrilla in about five to seven feet of water. Uh, these bass move up on these big flats during the pre-spawn period to actually spawn a lot of fish in lakes like Toledo Bend and Sam Rayburn, a lot of your shallow water type lakes. The bass will actually spawn way offshore out in the center of the lake in four, five, and even six feet of water. This water is fairly clear, so there will be some bass spawning out here a little later on, even in five and six feet of water. I'm fishing a Bomber 7A now. I'm trying to get down a little bit deeper. I'm kind of working the perimeters of this big flat, standing seven to eight foot, and I'm not fishing the very shallowest portion of it, but I'm looking for the bass to be just moving up on the flat, and I'm kind of crank, crank baiting the perimeters of it. The Bomber 7A is always a real productive lure this time of the year for me. And I basically use three different retrieves when I'm fishing this lure. The slow retrieve, as I'm doing here, just a real slow retrieve. Sometimes this time of the year when the water is cold, you don't want to move the lure very fast. You want to fish it slow. So a slow retrieve is one method of fishing it. The next method is, is a medium retrieve. And again, the medium retrieve seems to always be the most productive retrieve that uh, you can use. That's neither fast nor slow, just sort of medium, as I'm saying. Just reel it sort of at a medium pace and keep the lure coming. That retrieve seems to be the best, uh, most productive retrieve for me. Got a little hydrilla on my lure. As I said, these flats uh, have some scattered hydrilla on them and that's what the bass move up and hold in is the scattered grass. The other retrieve that'll work for you is a fast retrieve. You know, I'm making fairly long casts with the crankbait where I can cover a little bit more water. Uh, the fast retrieve, of course, you just speed it up and kind of get out on that reel and make it hum a little bit. Just bring it on in. There's times when the fast retrieve will produce strikes and normally that's when the water has warmed up, say six degrees and above. Same as we were talking about earlier with the rattle trap. 
Uh, one other type retrieve that works somewhat for me with uh, your deep build crankbaits is a stop and go method. Now that's simply you just cast the lure out and crank her down, try to get the lure on down into five to six foot of water and then reel it and stop. Crank up and go again and stop. Kind of stop and go with a pause. Now when you pause the lure and stop it, a lot of times that's when the bass is going to move in and hit the crankbait. So the stop and go technique can be real productive at times when the bass are a little bit sluggish or you have to do something a little bit extra to get the bass to hit the lure. Now this particular 7A that I'm using here is not running exactly the way I want it to. In other words, it's not fishing uh, exactly straight. So I'm going to talk about tuning baits for a minute. This one here is running off to the right. As you can see when I'm, I'm using the medium retrieve, it's sort of veering off to the right on me just a little bit and I don't like it to do that. I want the lure to come right back straight at me and, and fish properly. So to tune a crankbait is real simple. What you need is a good pair of needle nose pliers and uh, my lure is running slightly to the right, so what I want to do to tune it and make it come back right at me is sort of uh, take the tip of these pliers and I'm going to get on the little eyelet and I'm not going to twist it now, I'm going to bend it straight over to the left, just very slightly. I don't want to over tune it. So I'm bending it slightly to the left. Sometimes it takes a little bit of experimenting. Now I'll have to make another cast to see if I've done any good with it. I usually just carry my pliers with me when I'm doing this because I'm going to have to probably uh, uh, make a little bit more adjustment to it. Sometimes you can bend it one time and it comes out perfect. Let's see what I've done here. Okay, that's looking real good. I made just a slight, just bent the eyelet slightly to the left and the crankbait's coming right back to me. And one reason you want that lure coming straight back at you is uh, the crankbait is actually achieving its greatest, greatest depth when it's coming right back at you. You want it to come right back toward you straight. If it's running off to the right or veering off to the left, it's not going to go to its uh, maximum depth. And this is real important when catching fish on a crankbait. There you go. Well, it's right where I thought they were going to be. There's a little bald spot out here where the hydrilla quit growing in about seven foot of water. And these fish are holding right up on top of it. They're moving in here, getting ready to spawn. That's a good bass. There you go. Okay, we're in seven foot of water now, right up on top of this ridge. Again, we're out in open water. This is a big main lake flat that extends all the way out from shore, all the way out nearly to the old Sabine River Channel where it drops off into real deep water. Uh, a lot of hydrilla is growing on the outer edges of this big flat, and these fish are not in the grass. They're not relating to any cover right now. They're up on, right on top of the ridge in the very shallowest part of it in seven foot. And watch the depth finder here, and you can see that we're, uh, we're gonna go off into the weed growth, and we'll start picking up some vegetation on the depth finder in just a few minutes here, and that'll be the hydrilla. Uh, again, these bass are not relating to cover. They're right on the bare bottom. A lot of times they do that this time of the year when they're moving up to spawn. They're just laying around in that open water up there on top of the ridge and they're not actually spawning yet, but they, it won't be long. Once the water temperature moves on up into the 60s, they'll start their spawning. Right now, out on this ridge, the water temperature is about 59 degrees, so we're not too far off from the spawn. I think you can see now we're starting to get into some real scattered hydrilla. You're starting to pick it up on the depth finder and I can see it. We're moving off into nine feet of water now and we're getting out towards the edge of this ridge. Golly! Look at here. Boy, that, that bass hit close to the boat. Now that's what you have to be ready for when you're crankbaiting. You never know when one's going to hit. It may be at the end of a cast, or it could be up close to the boat, like this fella hit. Come here, buddy. There we go. It's a nice fish. Now back to the needle nose pliers. See if we can get him out. There you go. After most of the bass have spawned, 
which usually occurs like here on Toledo Bend, for instance, it's late April or May or even on into June, you know, and the, and the majority of the bass have already spawned and, and start their movement back towards deep water where they'll spend the entire summer months. Uh, we go to large crankbaits in that uh, deep diving type crankbaits that will get down into 15, uh, uh, even 20 feet of water. Uh, let me talk about a few of these. One of my favorites, or the first one here I have, is the, uh, the deep little end. This lure with about 10 pound line will get down to oh, 10 or 12 feet and when the bass are holding at those depths, it's a great lure. I've caught a lot of fish on it and I have a lot of confidence in it. You know, after you fish for a number of years as I have, I've got certain lures that have always produced for me that I have a lot of confidence in and the, uh, the deep little end is one of them. Another lure that I do real well with is the Bagley uh, DB2. Now this little lure will get down to, again, about 10 and 12 feet and it's real productive. Uh, during the post spawn or once the bass move on off into the summer places and get out in all 10, 12 to, to 15 feet of water. An old standby lure I've used for years that's been around a long time is the Rebel Max ER. Now, I've caught a lot of big bass on this lure. It's particularly good during the summer months on, and a lot of your lakes like over in Alabama, you follow West Point, uh, Seminole, just a whole lot of lakes that come to my mind. Wiley, Lake Wiley up in South Carolina, lakes that I have fished before, the, the Rebel Max AR, or any of these deep diving lures are great lures during the summer months when bass move out on long points that run out nearly to the old river channel, places like this with 10, or, uh, 10 feet of water on top of them and drop abruptly off into 15 and 20 feet. You can actually take these big lures with a 10 pound line and crank them down and actually bump the bottom in 10 foot. And when this big lure leaves that point, and drops off into deeper water as you're bumping it across a point, bang, that's usually when you catch that big bass. But these are great summertime deep diving crankbaits. Another one, these are, these are relatively new. The Bomber 9A is a new lure. It came on the market about a year ago, and these lures are somewhat new, and I have not uh, caught that many bass on them, but I can see a lot of potential for them, and I'm learning to use them just like you fishermen will be. But the 9A, so far I've caught a, a good many bass on it and I'm starting to, to gain confidence in this lure and it won't be long before it'll be a regular in my tackle box. Uh, this lure will get down around 15 to 18 feet depending on the size of line that you use. If you'll notice, most of these lures that I'm holding up are, are shad pattern. Now during the summer months, you know your bass are feeding primarily on shad this time of the year. So I fish either a Tennessee shad uh, pattern lure or chromes, black back, chrome, blue back or any type of shad finish seems to work awful well during the summer months. Another new lure that just came on the market is the DB3 Dredge. Now this lure is put out by Bagley Bait Company and it has capabilities of going down 18 to 20 feet of water and again it's fairly new but I have done real well with it so far and, and I think it's going to gain a place in my tackle box also. You know we're still experimenting with these new plugs. Uh, the capabilities that they have getting down into 18 and 20 and even 22 feet of water, you realize the lighter line you throw on these big plugs, actually the deeper you can get them. And by taking the big two-handed rod, the big two-handed seven-foot rod, and sticking about three foot of this rod in the water, you can crank these lures down and get them down into 20 and 22 foot of, of water actually. And we're going to be fishing crankbaits in water that we've never fished uh, crankbaits in before. So we have a lot to learn about that yet. But again, the DB3 dredge has caught a number of fish for me already, even though it is a new lure. The Man's Deep 20, another real producer. Now this one here, you can tell the old lip is just beat up and banged around. I've already caught a, probably uh, 15 or 20 bass on this particular lure. And I think it's going to be a real killer in the, in the, in the future. This lure goes down to about 20 to 22 foot, depending on uh, the size line you use. If you're using 8 and 10 pound test, you can get it to go real deep. And it's not that hard to pull. I found this lure to be relatively easy to pull uh, compared to some of the other big lip lures that are on the market. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of confidence in this lure, and I feel like that uh, uh, if you learn to fish these big lures, you're going to be able to get them down into deep water, into places that the bass are staying during the summer months and water that's unfished by a lot of other anglers, but there's a special technique involved in fishing them, and that's what we're gonna be talking about next. After most of the bass have spawned, you know, and moved back out towards deep water where they'll spend the summer months, uh, again, this usually occurs in, all oh, sometime in late April and May, once the water temperatures get on up into the high 70s. Uh, you can expect to find bass then out off the end of these flats, out in deeper water, like in 12 to 15, even down into 20 feet of water. Uh, on the drop. I'm fishing the outer edges of this flat 
and uh, there's a lot of hydrilla out here. These bass are, are seeking that uh, more of a, a comfort zone now, getting in the hydrilla, and they're real active early in the mornings and late in the evenings, but during the day, uh, uh, these bass actually, you'd probably have to catch them on a plastic worm once, uh, once they get out into the deeper hydrilla, but early and late, crankbaits can be real effective, and we're gonna talk about how to fish crankbaits out on the drops and use the deep diving plugs using the big two-handed seven-foot rod and talk a little bit about deep cranking and how to get that lure down to the maximum depth and catch summertime bass on a crankbait. Right now, I'm throwing a, a deep little end which has capabilities on this 10-pound line of going down all oh, about 10 or 12 feet. You know, a, a buddy of mine, a guy that uh, fishes the Bass Tournament Trail with me, a guy by the name of Paul Elias, made this deep cranking sort of popular in 1982 when he won the Bassmasters Classic using this technique. Now, old Paul, he just kind of gets down on his knees and sticks that rod in the water like this. And by doing that, see, you can get your lure to run deeper. He holds that rod under the water and cranks that lure down to get it to its maximum depth. See there, I got that one down that time and got right in the hydrilla. I got it down uh, nearly at the bottom in about 15 feet of water. And normally this little lure will only run 12 feet, so I'm getting a little more depth out of it by kneeling and reeling. Some fishermen have the misconception also that crankbaits only catch small fish. Another buddy of mine, Rick Clun, in 1984, caught the biggest catch of bass ever caught in a Bassmasters Classic on a crankbait up on the uh, Arkansas River at Pine Bluff. Rick caught 21 bass during that Classic that weighed 70 pounds. Boy, that's astonishing. I'll tell you, crankbaits can produce a lot of big bass once you learn to fish them and where to fish them and, and exactly how to fish them. But again, once you get out in this deep water, using the kneeling and reeling technique, keeping that rod tip either under the water or very low to the water, you're getting it down to its deeper depth and you're bumping the top of that grass. Now the deep little end, again, it has capabilities with using the kneeling and reeling system of getting it down into about 15 feet of water. I'm gonna change lures now and go to one that'll run a little bit deeper. big shad colored bomber 9a it'll run on get on down there about uh, 15 to 18 feet and we've moved off now I'm a little bit farther out off this ledge and I'm actually sitting in 20 foot of water uh, a lot of bass this time of year again are going to be caught in deeper water and I can pretty well touch the bottom in about 15 to 18 foot with this lure again you make real long cast try to get that lure out there as far as you can to get it to achieve its maximum depth capabilities I usually use a, a medium retrieve on these big crankbaits, and uh, this one here is detuned to some extent. It's not running exactly true. So again, I'm gonna have to kind of tune it a little bit. You want that lure running right back at you where it'll get down to that maximum depth, and it's running just a little bit off to the left. So what I'm gonna do is take my pliers again and tune it and, and turn it just a little hair to the right. I'm gonna get the little eyelet and just bend it slightly to the right and try to correct this. I think that did it. There we go, that's better. Now again, I'm in, I'm in 19 to 20 feet of water and I'm just bumping the tops of the grass right now. As you'll notice when I come in this time, I'm probably gonna have a little hydrilla. Believe it or not, this big lure doesn't pull that hard. It's a, really a good fishing lure and I've already caught a lot of good fish on it. It's fairly new and only been out uh, about six months, but here in Texas, it's already been a, a big bass producer. A lot of big fish have been caught on it. There again, these lures are a little bit different than cranking the smaller crankbaits. They'll work you a little bit harder, so I think the two-handed rod is a must. You can't throw a big three-quarter ounce lure with a little one-handed rod. It'll just work you to death. So you need the big seven-foot, two-handed model. Uh, I like this rubber butt plate on the back where I can stick it into my gut and kind of crank on it. It just makes it a lot easier. If you're gonna throw this lure all day, you can see what, uh, what type of work you're getting into. Okay, let me change here. We didn't get one to hit that. I'm picking up a little hydrilla. I'm going to show you a couple of other lures that are real producers and have been for me out in the deep water that are good summertime crankbaits. And again, you just have to try them and 
see which one the fish like, cover a little bit of water with them. This new DB3 dredge will get down about 20 foot deep. This one is made by Bagley Lure Company, Tennessee shad pattern. Again, during the summer months and most of the bass are feeding on shad, so I try to use a, a lure that, that imitates the shad that looks somewhat like the bait fish the bass are feeding on. Make your long cast and I usually, I don't actually stick my rod in the water most of the time. I just hold it low to the water. With these new extremely deep divers, you don't have to. Just keep that rod tip close to the, close to the water and you'll, uh, you'll bump bottom in about 20 foot. I'm already in the grass with this one. You know, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the most productive spots for summertime cranking. We're cranking the edge of a big flat uh, here on Toledo Bend, but you may be fishing over in Alabama or up at Lake Gaston in Virginia or shoot the St. Lawrence River up in New York or somewhere else. And crankbaits work uh, real well anywhere in the United States I've ever fished for bass during all seasons of the year. But long points uh, that drop off into real deep water, rocky points, or points with stumps on them, some type of cover, uh, they're real productive spots during the, uh, the summer months for crankbait fishing. Other spots are old road beds that come up out on the, ma uh, on the main lake. Uh, for instance, an old road bed that runs out and has 8 or 10, 12 foot of water on top of it. It can even have 15 or 20 now because with these new crankbaits, we can get down 15 and 20 feet deep. So these type places are good places to crank. Old uh, farm pond dams, places like that, any type of ridge or hump or underwater spot out in the center of the lake near the old river channel that comes up to within 15 foot of the surface is a good place to crank during the summer months. Doesn't hurt if it has a little cover on it too. Things like stumps and uh, old logs or maybe even standing timber. You know, I do a lot of cranking in standing timber. Again, uh, we're here cranking vegetation and if you're fishing in Florida, you're gonna be doing a lot of crankbait fishing over vegetation. You probably wouldn't be using the, the big deep divers, but You'd be fishing five to seven foot of water a lot of times, like on Lake Okeechobee. A lot of crankbait fish are caught there, along the, the uh, particularly on the east side of the lake, along the rocks. And they do a lot of cranking, and you know, five to eight feet of water is, is a tremendously great way to catch bass on crankbaits. There you go. That one hit the DB3 dredge, and I was headed down about 18 feet probably when this fish hit. He came out of the hydrilla. I was just bumping the top of it, and you see this bass has already spawned out. It's a little skinny male. But these fish are holding out off this flat in about 18 feet of water, and again, you've got to get that crankbait down to its maximum depth, get it down there about 18 to 20 feet before you expect to catch these fish. That's why these extremely deep divers are going to work so well. We can actually get these lures to go down into depths that we haven't been fishing before with crankbaits. Got a little high drill on it. Now let's see if we can catch another one. Another real productive spot for, for deep cranking during the summer months is distinct points like we have here. This big point comes out and drops right off into the old Sabine River channel. Uh, got a lot of big rocks on it, good cover for the bass to hide in, and good access to deep water. Caught a lot of good bass off this point cranking it in the summer months. Ah, boy, there's a good one. <clears throat> Come here. Oh, that's a good bass. That one hit right after that crankbait left the rocks and started out into deep water. Now, this is the kind of fish you catch on these old big crankbaits. Oh, boy. Just let him fight. Come here, boy. Ah, there, look at here. That's about a four pounder. Boy, that's a good one. This fish hit, I was cranking this real steep point. There's a lot of big old rocks out off the point. And just about the time that crankbait bounced off that end rock and jumped into deep water, he hit it. That's where a lot of fish are gonna be holding during the summer months. They're gonna be out off the, uh, the rocks and where it drops off into steeper water. There you go. Get back up there real quick, see if I can catch another one. A lot of times, it's not unusual to catch two or three or even four or five bass off of one point like this. They school up on these type places.
During this program, I've covered a lot of information pertaining to crankbait fishing. We've talked about uh, sizes of crankbaits, different crankbaits that will work in different time, times of the year and in different depths of water. We've talked about how to match line size to the different size of crankbaits that you're using. We've talked about the different rods that you use for fishing crankbaits, such as the uh, uh, for fishing the large crankbaits, you use the big two-handed rod. Fishing the smaller ones, you need a, a limber six-foot rod. One-handed rod is best suited for fishing the smaller lightweight crankbaits. Uh, but main, mainly you need to keep in mind that when crankbait fishing, you have to choose a crankbait to fish with that will run at the depth the fish are at. Once you, once you establish the fact that their fish are in five to seven feet of water, you need to be fishing a crankbait that goes down to that depth. If the fish are off in 15 or 20, you have to choose a crankbait that will get down to the depth those fish are holding at, depending on the time of the year and what the bass are doing. We also covered colors. As I said uh, earlier in the program, I, I feel like colors that uh, you need to choose colors that will resemble some type of bait fish that the bass are feeding on, whether it be crawfish, brim, or shad, or whatever. Your shad patterns work at times, other times crawfish patterns work. You just have to try the different patterns, the different colors, and let the bass tell you what they like best. Well, I sincerely hope during this program the techniques that we've covered uh, pertaining to crankbait fishermen will help all of y'all to become better crankbait fishermen.